In, our central interest is the blood-brain barrier and how drugs don't cross the blood-brain barrier. And one of the most common tumors uh, that get cisplatin, as you just mentioned, is medulloblastoma. And we, we were looking for a better chemotherapy to treat patients with medulloblastoma, which is one of the five tumors in children they get cisplatin. I mean, the majority of children with solid tumors either get carboplatin or cisplatin. We tested a, a, a relatively new agent called, it's an analog of cisplatin because cisplatin is very neurotoxic if you open the blood-brain barrier. And we studied carboplatin and it worked beautifully in, both in tissue culture and in animals. And we proceeded to do the, the typical thing, which is a phase one trial. Uh, much to our surprise, carboplatin with blood-brain barrier opening resulted in high frequency hearing loss, just like it does with cisplatin and without barrier opening. And one of the first patients that we treated was a college professor from the East Coast who ha had no children and her, 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 her main enjoyment, besides being married to David Scheim, uh, was teaching. And she had ovarian cancer, which spread to the left temporal lobe, which is the speech center of the brain. And to take that out would have sacrificed her speech. So that was not acceptable. So uh, they came out to my office with no appointment, uh, and a stack full of papers uh, saying why she wanted to have chemotherapy with opening the blood-brain barrier. And we just at that time had the toxicity phase of carboplatin delivery across the blood-brain barrier. And so we, we told her we, we, she qualifies. It's a, it's a platinum-sensitive tumor. And we started opening her blood-brain barrier. And she did beautifully, as David points out, in uh, her therapy, with one exception. She developed high-frequency hearing loss. And just as we've just heard, if you have high-frequency hearing loss, you can't hear in a classroom. But she was the professor. So this was really damaging her ability to practice. Her husband, David Scheim, worked at the NIH, and, and, and he assures me of two things. One, it was not government time. He said he, he, he searched the internet on, on l his lunch hour. Uh, and, uh, and he found an anecdote, and he's never been willing to tell me the details of how he found it, uh, except that it was on non-government time. And it said that maybe uh, the drug, which uh, D David Fryer pointed out, is th the only indication really for it is cyanide poisoning. And it's almost never given to people. The, the FDA approval was in case there was cyanide poisoning. And it was all based upon animal studies for FDA approval. Um, he came out because his wife developed high frequency hearing loss with a bottle of sodium thiosulfate and wanted us to give that drug to her his wife. We had absolutely no data to say that that was safe and we said we couldn't do it. And then he asked if he could put a, if he could put a few drops in her outer ear. And I said, no, we can't do that. We, we would breach all IRB rules. But we, we, his case being, in, being from the NIH, and the, the, the husband of a, of a woman who got unexpected hearing loss, we, we, we went to the Department of Pharmacology, where, as was pointed out, the other thing that causes high-frequency hearing loss is an antibiotic called an aminoglycoside. And again, it's outer hair cells of the cochlea that get damaged. And this Dr. Bob Brummett was literally packing his office to retire when the head of otolaryngology and I tripped him up and asked if he could stay another month or two and test this drug that David Schein had suggested. And the, modifying the 
the paradigm from an uh, antibiotic-induced standard hearing loss to carboplatin and cisplatin was done expeditiously because Dr. Brummett was the expert on the model. And the bottom line was it worked perfectly. If you separate the carboplatin or the cisplatin in time and space, so STS doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, and if you give it six hours later when all the platinum is gone, you still can protect the hearing. And we used his model, which was the guinea pig. Guinea pigs are hard to use when you're studying tumors, and we had to also be sure that we didn't protect the tumor. And we did extensive studies, initially funded by the Veterans Administration, but subsequently by the National Institutes of Health. And th th that funding allowed us to, to do all these studies, both first in the guinea pig and then in the rat. And th the bottom line is if we separated the platinum, which has a half-life of less than an hour, from the sodium thiosulfate, which we found was most efficacious if we gave it six hours after we, s we, we separated in time and space. The one, one of the most common tumors to get to get cisplatinum is is medulloblastoma, but the other four tumors that commonly get it uh, are not in the brain, and so you have to have the time and have all the platinum cleared before you give the antidote uh, for cyanide. And it took industrial doses, 20 times the dose that is given for cyanide poisoning. It was, it was the dose that we found worked in people. Uh, and we, we did it. We didn't help Abri's, Ab, uh, Mrs. Ziffer, Dr. Ziffrin, who was the patient, uh, but we, we started uh, based upon the animal studies, the tissue culture studies, all of which was done in our laboratory. We proceeded to do an efficacy trial, and we went with blood-brain barrier disruption and carboplatin uh, we went from 80% of the patients having hearing loss to virtually none, and from 50% hearing aids to virtually none. And indeed, we wanted, we, were, we had the problem of having to consider to do a randomized phase three trial, but the Institutional Review Board wouldn't let us do it because they said there was no equipoise. I mean, if you have 50% hearing, hearing aids without the drug and none with the drug, it wouldn't be ethical since there was no evidence in the patients that we did in the phase two trial uh, that we, we interfered with tumor protection. So we published those results and were invited by the two major pediatric groups in the world, COG, which is the Children's Oncology Group, uh, and by SIOP, which is the, this group, to give a, a, a lecture about what we did in adults because this so tremendously impacted the quality of life of children uh, with the cisplatin, which 80% of overall are cured. But as you've heard, the toxic sequelae, particularly with the, in regard to the hearing, is, quote, mild. But it's, as Christy pointed out, it's a really big deal. So we worked with a, 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 a Dr. Pat Reynolds to make sure we simulated the, the, the situation uh, in children with, 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 with tumors with cisplatin as opposed to carboplatin, and both to show that we could protect the hearing, which was easy, but we need, we need to be sure that we didn't protect uh, the tumor. And we did extensive studies. Uh, the, mo the, the, the best was actually done uh, in Los Angeles uh, with the help of my son, and who was a medical student. Uh, and we tested the tumor protection, and there was none, if you separated it by six hours. And the, the protection was dramatic. At, at that point, uh, there were two camps. Those who said, yes, it protects the hearing, but at least theoretically, despite all your animal studies and your adult studies with carboplatin, we can't be sure that we may not be able to protect could not rule out that there'd be some protection of the tumor from the chemo curative chemotherapy. And the other camp said, this is a terrible complication. 
and all the extensive an animal and tissue culture studies. It was 28 peer-reviewed papers uh, before we started doing um, the, the cisplatin. Uh, we should go ahead. So the, the Americans, which is COG, were still concerned about tumor protection. But the Europeans, Dr. Brock, um, in particular, said, come on over to Switzerland, we'll, we'll work this out, and we'll do a trial um, in children, very carefully to make sure we don't protect the tumor, but protect the hearing. And then Pepe presented that in Amsterdam, at, at which point the Americans decided that they, they wanted to do their own study. So there were two studies that were born. Uh, and both of them took a, l a long time, seven years, uh, and the, the first one was presented and published in Lancet, on Onc Lancet Oncology this last year, and the second one we're going to hear about this afternoon, uh, although the, the, there was no evidence of hearing protection in the data that was presented at the American Society of Clinical Oncology last June. Uh, but the, the final results we'll hear from Pepe. Uh, the, 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 the only question um, with regard to the current studies that are publicly known, and the rest will, you'll hear about this afternoon, was a, what's called a, what David talked about, which was a post hoc analysis, suggesting there may be some tumor protection in patients with dim disseminated disease. But post hoc analysis, this an unplanned evaluation really doesn't, the, the study wasn't designed to do it. And there were there are a variety of reasons why uh, in disseminated disease this may, 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 may have had some protection, although it's, it, it, it's not clear. The biggest is disseminated disease is biologically a different disease. There's a protein that's made by tumor cells that incite dissemination that's not present in, in patients with localized disease as the, our colleagues in Toronto showed at the, the American Association of Cancer Research meeting last fall. We're, we're concerned about this potential, but the, 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 that potential should not translate into negating the results in localized disease, which are biologically such that there's absolutely no evidence of tumor protection. And that's the discussion that's still on, ongoing. We're, we're looking at that very carefully uh, because it, it is of concern, but not for people with localized disease. And in fact, one of my MD, PhD students has just uh, completed a manuscript which shows that if you have what David was talking about, concomitant inflammatory problems because of having disseminated cancer, which the patients are much more sick and much more prone to get infections and so forth, that the inflammatory response opens the blood brain and blood cochlear barrier such that uh, it may not be the SDS, but, r but rather the inflammation that gets more of the uh, 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 drug entering the platinum, entering the cochlea and injuring the outer hair cells. So th that, that, that's a fair question, but in my opinion, uh, the two studies both show without any argument that there's no evidence of tumor protection and there's outstanding hearing protection. The question remains in, is this post hoc analysis, which was unplanned, um, in some way protecting the tumor uh, from the platinum. And based upon all our studies, the inflammation is likely be, to be the cause of the problem and not, and not, and not really the sodium thiosulfate. Uh, but that's, that's under study and we, we, we are funded both by the NIH and the uh, Veterans Administration to study these issues uh, back in the laboratory as we proceed with trying to roll out the use of sodium thiosulfate and justifiably try to get approval by, by, by the medical authorities both in Europe and in uh, America, the FDA, and the discussant 
of Pepe's paper this, after, this afternoon. It turns out to be the associate, one of the associate directors of the FDA, and we'll hear what he has to say about all this data. Um, but, and, and the last thing I want to say is, although a lot of these studies were done by me in my uh, laboratory, I've divested any financial interest in this. So I have, I, I have no chance of, in the past, present or future getting any financial gain. But I think that this is an incredible opportunity where we went from the laboratory to the clinic using carboplatin and basically eliminated Abby Ziffrin's brain tumor and never came back, but gave her high frequency hearing loss, which we didn't expect with carboplatin, to going back to the laboratory, working it out, then going to the clinic again uh, with sodium thiosulfate and doing this trial. Uh, to show that you could protect the hearing and at the same time not protect the tumor by separation in time and space.